What's going on, guys? The economic boogie woogie. The rich get richer and the poor get fucked. Before we get in this video, I have something to say. To all of the members of the NURB tribe, to the people who enjoy these videos, the people who enjoy the comments, who leave positive comments and really listen to the videos, I wanna say thank you, I appreciate you. Now, to the weak ass motherfuckers who are talking about the strong language, you need to fucking leave with your weak ass. I'm like, here, let me go ahead and explain some stuff to you. Being a business owner, it's gonna put some fucking hair on your chest. If you cannot sit in your house on your ass and listen to me cuss without losing your mind, you are a weak motherfucker and you're not gonna make it doing the great reset, the global wealth transfer, and the new world order. You're gonna be one of the first people who are gonna get fucked up the ass because you a weak little bitch. Unsubscribe. Stop telling me how to run my fucking channel. I've been doing this shit for 13 fucking years. What have you been doing for 13 years that has made you millions of dollars? Not shit. So stop trying to direct my channel to bring me down to your bitch ass level. Stop it. Cause essentially if you've seen the comments like I'm cussing you motherfuckers out. You don't run shit around here. You're not my programming director. If you don't like the content, move the fuck on. This video was brought to you by B-School for Hustlers. The introduction of the intellectual property school. A lot of you have been waiting for this. In about two weeks, this is the pre-launch. In about two weeks, I'm going to start putting content in the training portal for the intellectual property school, teaching you how to do what I do. First disclaimer, this is not quick money. Building a YouTube channel, writing a book, creating an online course. These are not quick money hustles. This isn't something you can shake a little hustle dust at and make some money. This is gonna take a person who is gonna be willing to sit down, invest in themselves, invest in a YouTube channel, a podcast, writing a book, or creating an online course. These are the things that have made me millions of dollars. Millions. And if you want to direct and improve your future, enroll in the Intellectual Property School today. The link is below. And this is what I'm gonna do. Everyone that enrolls in the Intellectual Property School, I'm going to grant you access to home economics. So you go ahead, so you'll have two logins because the Intellectual Property School is at B School for Hustlers and the Home Economics says Glendon Cameron School. So you'll have two logins. But if you go ahead and I'm offering a 65% pre-launch discount, which means you get 65% off if you go ahead and buy the Intellectual Property School during these two weeks before I launch links below all right so let's talk about the boogie woogie this could be considered strong cocaine number two y'all really enjoyed that video you want to know why you enjoyed that video because i was happy to make it because i'm getting back in original form for those of you who've been around for the last 13 years you know that i used to cuss quite a bit in my videos and one of the things that used to irk me is when people would recommend me they would give me a disclaimer. It's like, Glendon Carey puts out a lot of good information, but he cusses a lot. He cusses. All right, I'm about to tell you a little story before we get into strong cocaine number two. Years and years ago, you have to understand where I came from. I was in the storage auction business. I was in a rugged, independent, dynamic marketplace, which means I was bidding against other people spending real money to buy units. Let me say that again. I was participating in a raw dynamic arena. And one of the things I quickly ascertained within about six months 
was I needed to spend some money. And this is something that happened one day. I developed a reputation because I would bid against the big dogs because I had the money, but I didn't have the knowledge. So it was had to be kind of careful because I was still learning the business. And at some point, about two and a half years in, I had developed a reputation. And I remember I was up at public storage and it was me and Bobby. We we're the only two regulars because, you know, every month we get a bunch of new people come out and they would see how hard it was or they would buy units that was trash and they would leave. And it was just me and Bobby. And like Bobby knew me. Bobby knew that I was a motherfucker. Bobby knew that I would get. And see, this is one of the things I learned. Uh, when I got on someone, I didn't just bit them up on one unit. This shit went on for months. I made people fucking cry because it's like, you want to fuck with me? I'm going to show you that that was a mistake. And I punished people. I punished people. And I, once again, it was just my personality. So Bobby knew who I was. And this day, there was something like, it was crazy. It was like 36 units. It was wild. And I had like 16, almost $20,000 cash on me. And I had an empty warehouse. So I was ready to buy. And before the auction started, Bobby came to me and said, if you don't bid against me, I will not bid against you. Because Bobby understood the situation. It was me and him against a bunch of unseasoned, untrained rookies. And he knew that this could be a big payday. And he knew that if he started fucking with me, I was going to make him pay. <coughs> See, that was a, a demonstration of real fucking power because Bobby came to me and I was like, you know, at that point, I didn't trust people because people would try to set up these deals and then they would fucking bid against you. So I was going to see what he was going to do. And I was like, all right. And the first few units came up. It was like five units. I didn't want them. And then Bobby was up from the hills, like deliverance and shit. And Bobby loved tool units, construction units. And there was this unit that came up that was full of uh, ladders. If you don't know, uh, an extension ladder could be five, 600 bucks. This one unit popped open. There was 10 extension ladders. There was wheelbarrows. There was generators and stuff. And I know Bobby's dick got hard. And he was just like, $500. And I didn't want the shit. So I didn't bid on it. And then another unit came up and then uh, it was it was kind of his his scheme, his format, because people had certain categories that they bought units in. And Bobby bought the second unit. Right. And we're about 10 units in and I ain't see nothing I want. Then a twofer. And what is a twofer? It's someone who's in default that has two storage units. And this person had not one 10 by 30, but two that were full from the Ruta to the Tuda. And, the first, and they raised both doors at the same time. And I was sitting there like 100 bucks, right off the rip. Because that was what that was my jam, right? And Bobby didn't say shit. And then some of the new people were like, and they were whispering. It's like, then, you know, some of the people was like 120. And I was like 200. And I got both those fucking units for $300. Because Bobby didn't bid against me. If Bobby had bid against me, those units would have cost me two, $3,000. And I went ahead and lowered the door and put the lock on it. And I started rubbing. I knew I made like $25,000 off those two units. It was someone who had a mansion and all the furniture from the mansion went in there. I mean, ornate mirrors, seven bedroom sets, three dining room sets. It had a go-kart in there. Uh, it was model airplanes. I mean, it was just a fucking dream unit. And that day, um, I bought eight units, those two plus six more. And I spent maybe, maybe 1500. And if, if the Clampets had been there, that day would have cost me five to 7,000 easy, easy. So it was a good day. I got a lot of good units, really, really cheap. And this is who I am. I am a rugged fucking individual. I don't play with people and I don't lie like Anton Daniels. He's been caught in a lot of lies. Had him on uh, JT Pocket Watchers 
which was just a complete farce because JT let him off easy in my opinion. But I don't lie. And one of the things that you motherfuckers need to understand, once again, stop telling me in the comments how I should run my fucking YouTube channel. Do you have a 13 year old YouTube channel? Have you made millions of fucking dollars from YouTube? No, then stop fucking telling someone who's done it. Michael Jordan said the best. It ain't bragging when you talk about shit that you've already done. I've done this shit. I own this shit. I am the motherfucking man when it comes to this intellectual property YouTube shit. I, I remember years and years ago, I went to Daryl E's first YouTube summit, vid summit, and I was just sitting around because I had a really small YouTube channel and we were just talking about how much money you made. And I was talking to this girl who had 1.6 million subscribers. She did um, sewing. She would go to thrift stores, find stuff, and she would remake the pieces. And she's like, oh, I do like $6,000 a month. And I was like, oh, I'll do 50. And she was like, looking at my channel, she says, how do you, because I sell a product. I really don't make that much AdSense money, but because I sell a product, I do consistently about 40 to $50,000 a month. And when I started talking to people, people were like, who had way bigger YouTube channels, had way more subscribers, had bigger view counts, and I was killing them from the income angle. It was killing them. They were like, I remember walking around, I'm gonna tell you a little dirty little story. And for those of you who's like, I don't wanna hear about you fucking, I'm sorry you ain't getting no pussy. I'm sorry you ain't had no bad bitches in your past. I am so sorry that it makes you feel inadequate and small when they hear about a masculine dominant man laying down the pipe. So sorry. Fucking leave the channel with your weak ass. I remember it was a vid summit and uh, this is the first time I'm telling this story. And uh, I was going upstairs because I had already checked in because one of the things I would do when I went to vid summit is I would go a day early and I leave a day after so I would have time because I wouldn't be rushing to the airport and stuff. And I got there a day early so I was already checked in and stuff. And I remember this chick, whoo, she was nice. And uh, she had a bunch of bags and I was walking. She said, could you help me? And I said, sure. So I opened up her door and helped her in there. And for some reason, my, my radar, my radar was like, this chick is submissive. This chick is submissive. And a uh, white girl from the Midwest, and I let her in the room, and for some reason, I just knew that I could get away with some stuff, because she was in the room, we had moved her bags and stuff in, and the door automatically closed. And I just went behind her and grabbed her titties, and actually went under her shirt, went under her bra, and I was like, oh, these are fucking nice. And she just went, I was fucking that bitch the whole time during Vid Summit. I would like, literally, I, I didn't even spend no time in my room. I was in her room every night. She would like, cause uh, I just did that stuff. And then, you know, I actually left the room. I didn't fuck her at that time. Cause it was about like three o'clock, but 10 o'clock I was knocking on the door. She answered the door. She had a nightgown on, she was barefooted. And uh, I just went ahead and slipped my hand between her legs instantly wet so every night I got my dick sucked and every morning I got my dick sucked during vid summit sorry Daryl <laughs> I was like this is fun I enjoy vid summit and you know for all you who are here about you fucking I'm sorry you ain't getting no pussy I'm sorry you had no pussy I'm like you feeling inadequate you feeling like I am so sick and tired of this motherfucker talking about success. I am sick and tired of this motherfucker talking about fucking bad bitches. I am, oh, oh. Once again, shout out to the Nerd Tribe. You guys love this. You love the stories. Shout out to the real estate trapper who's laughing this ass off because here's the deal. During the boogie woogie, the rich are going to get richer. And for all of you silly, stupid motherfuckers who's like, well, you act like it, it's not a bubble. It's like, all right, the worst period, the worst economic period in the United States of America was the Great Depression. 25% unemployment, uh, food shortages, P 
people are homeless, people living off the land. It was really, really bad, okay? During the same economic period where 25% of Americans was suffering, the stock market was down for not one, but 10 fucking years, there was a group of people called Pope Fiction Writers. And these people became millionaires selling Pope Fiction at a nickel per book during the Great Depression. Wells Fargo became one of the largest banks in America buying defunct thrifts during the Great Depression. How do I know this? Because I read and study history. I don't spend time. I don't know what the fuck Kim Kardashian's doing. I don't know what the fuck Patrick Mahomes is doing in the off season. I don't give a fuck because that's silly shit. And all of you motherfuckers who devote so much of your time to silly shit that doesn't produce a profit, mm, 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 mm. get ready for the reset. I don't know if I told this story before, but I'm gonna tell it again. During, for, there are many of you, it's like, I don't wanna hear about you fucking. I don't wanna hear about you getting some pussy. Let me tell you what you're really saying. Stop making me feel bad about my inadequate ass because I've never had the game to get the type of bitches that I wanted. And I hate hearing about, I hate hearing you got money. I hate hearing you living well. I hate you hearing you eat steak dinners. I hate that you're fucking a bad bitch now. I fucking hate you, Glendon Cameron. That's what you're saying because you are a weak motherfucker. Now snort that strong cocaine. Tell you something that happened. Um, was a vid summit. Uh, I started going to Viz Summit early. They had like three before I started going, and I got to know a lot of the YouTube players. I personally know Daryl Eves. I know Tim Smoyer, Owen Video. I know a lot of people. And um, one time I was at Viz Summit. Sorry, Daryl, because uh, I would always fly in a day early and leave a day late, so I didn't have to be rushing. So I had time to network and get to know people. And I remember this girl from the Midwest. Uh, I had checked in, I was walking, and she had a bunch of bags, so she was struggling. She said, could you help me? So I opened up her hotel door for her and let her in her room, and I just had a feeling she was submissive. Just, I could feel it. And I had never met this chick. And I walked behind her and just slid my hands under her, neck, under her uh, shirt and under her bra and squeezed those big juicy breasts, and she oh. Didn't fuck her then. But during, I, I, I really didn't spend any, a lot of time in my room except to change, because every night after, you know, the vid summit activities were over, I would go to her room, I would get my dick sucked. Every night and every morning, I was fucking the shit out of this bitch. Sorry, moist, weak men, sorry. Sorry, Daryl, but that's how I enjoyed my vid summit. And one of the things that you guys have got to understand, and once again, to the Nerd Tribe, thank you guys, you understand. I have been doing this shit since 2009. Let me explain to you what's gonna happen as the economy gets worse. My student base is going to exponentially expand because people are gonna be faced with that strong cocaine, they're gonna be looking for ways to make money, and they're gonna find me. And they're gonna find all of that bullshit that all of those losers and worthless ass people put up on YouTube and they're not gonna give a fuck. They're not gonna give a fuck. I've had people leave stuff on this channel and like people are like, don't talk about that. Just give me game. Motherfucker, let me say it again. You don't run shit here. You're not my fucking program director. And if you don't like the content, you don't like the instruction, fucking leave with your weak ass. I will speak my truth. I will speak that shit. And if you don't like it, fuck you. That's right. The real Glendon Cameron is fucking back. And I'm gonna make a lot of money during this recession because I am positioned to make money. And one of the things that you have to understand, there's always gonna be a wealthy class. I don't care how much you hate these motherfuckers. I don't care how much, because see, there, right now, there's someone in college, right? And they're taking computer science with a major and a minor in cybersecurity. 
and they have a lot of hard ass classes. My girlfriend is in STEM. Some nights she's up to fucking 11 o'clock doing her homework and she's in STEM. It ain't no joke. She's being recruited by Apple. She's being recruited by the FBI. And there's someone there who's doing that shit and they're going to graduate and they're going to roll into a six figure job during the recession. See, this is the thing that you stupid motherfuckers don't understand. You're looking for meet Kevin. I want to invest $100 and I'm going to become a millionaire. You are a dumbass if you even believe that shit. And instead of like, okay, you know what? I have, I don't have an income problem. I have a skill set problem. Instead of recognizing and appreciate that, what do you do? You go to TikTok and lose five or six hours watching stupid shit, people dancing or people doing the funny TikTok voices or people talking about nothing but bullshit. So you spend, like if you would self audit your time, and this is one of the things that you will see and you will learn, because when I posted that the average age of an entrepreneur was like 42, and someone put it, he's like, the people who do this shit know this, but the folks who don't do this shit don't know it. See, I spend, at the moment, 90% of my time on things that make me money. Building businesses, creating content, doing YouTube videos, 90% of my time, and I will say I spend 10% of my time with my girl and other stuff. So 90% of my time is in the arena that's going to produce a dividend at some point. Because one of the things that you, if you would self audit yourself and literally take a little notebook and write down how much time you spend on bullshit and watching bullshit content, it will blow your mind. Uh, your Apple phone has a, it gives you something called screen time. And I got two Apple phones and like, you know, sometimes the other one, I'm barely on that phone, right? It was like your screen time has been reduced 90% of the time. Uh, what I've been doing this week, I've been watching a lot of podcasting stuff because uh, I've got my podcasting web page built. I got my intros and outros. I've got my podcast art. This is what I've been doing this week. And at some point, that's going to pay a dividend. Just like that college kid who's taking these hard ass computer science classes, he's gonna roll off into a six figure job and he's gonna be making $150,000, $170,000 at the age of 22 during a recession. During a re oh, those kind of jobs are not gonna disappear during a recession. You wanna know why? Cybersecurity specialists, people who have the credentials for cybersecurity, they will be able to walk in and put their dick on the table and it's like, I need 250 a year. Okay, during a recession. See, here's the thing that many of you don't understand. And to the nerd tribe, you're welcome for the education. I know you guys appreciate the content. You appreciate the accurate, hard, no bullshit, no fluff delivery. That if you get the right skill sets, you will be making money during a recession. See, the recession ain't going to touch everybody. The recession ain't touching me. I know the boys men are like, oh God, he goes to get bragging. All right, let me go ahead and have this conversation. Bitch, I ain't like you. My life ain't like yours. I don't fuck ugly bitches and I don't wake up and do shit that I don't want to do. My life ain't like yours. I know that many of you want to try to Bring me down so you can relate to me because you want to put me on a level. And shout out to the nerd game because the nerd game is like, I want to elevate. And you listen. I've had many comments it's like, I've been listening for years and my life has gotten better because I was following your directive. Because see, many of you men are feminine. And, it's, and, uh, and this is one of the things. Um, I've come to a realization why a lot of women are having problems uh, getting into relationships. They don't have relationship skills. You know how many women are fit to hit it and quit it, but they don't know how to stay. They don't know how to cuddle. They don't know how to cook breakfast. They don't know how to build a fucking relationship. And many of you feminine moist men are the same way because like, I I'll tell you a story. I was dealing with this chick and she was beautiful but she secretly resented the fact that I was very successful. 
and she tried to, you know, there was slick comments and the relationship lasted two weeks. And once I realized that she was a friend of me, that she was an enemy, cause she would say the most passive aggressive stuff. And one night I was like, you know what? You're a stupid bitch. And she's like, excuse me, you are a stupid bitch. I am a masculine dominant wealthy man and because your weak ass cannot deal with it, you're trying to sabotage your relationship. And I'm getting ready to tell you, I am done with you. I don't want to fuck you anymore. Matter of fact, this is going to be the last time I'm ever going to talk to your stupid ass. Because instead of trying to work with me and being a submissive woman, you want to be one of these rah-rah bitches. And this is why, and this is what's funny. This was about. 17, 18 years ago. And I went on Facebook and I found her and she has three children by three different men. She ain't married and she's struggling. See, cause she wanted to, and she don't look like she used to look. The years have been unkind to her. And I messaged her and I was like, how was that rah rah life? And she's like, who's this? And I was like, and I told her who I was. And I said the picture. And she's like, oh my God, I hate to admit it, but you were absolutely right. All I've gotten is heartache, you know, and she realized that the way that she was, she was fucked up because, you know, with the strong cocaine, a lot of bitches are going to come to a moment of truth that is like, damn, I need to be cooperative and submissive to get what I want because I was having a conversation with someone who wants to get a high value man, AKA Kevin Samuels, but she don't want to be around him. I was like, yeah, good luck with that. Just good luck with that. But once again, the economic boogie woogie is the rich are going to get richer because they're positioning themselves. They're spending time doing things to get rich. And like, once again, take my self auditing challenge for the next week take a small notebook and put down how much time you spend. I got two TVs. You know, my TVs may not come on for two days because I don't really spend a lot of time watching television. I spend 90% of my time focused on things that will produce a return in the future. Like today, I launched something new and like this podcast, I'm very excited about the podcast. Uh, I'm probably going to record the first episode tonight. And what I want to do is have five episodes before I let y'all know where they are, because that's the thing with podcasting. You can put up podcast after podcast and the discoverability is unlike YouTube because you can start a YouTube channel and then all of a sudden hit the algorithm just right. And then all kinds of people will discover you and TikTok is even greater. But podcasting, unless you know that you have to market your podcast, they're not going to do that really well. They're just not. So in this economic boogie woogie, I'm going to get richer. And this is one of the things that you guys don't understand. And this is the benefit of having a low stress lifestyle. I don't really stress and I have time to sit down, plan and activate and work on the projects I want to work. I don't do shit that I don't want to do. That's why I got rid of that car rental business because it was a pain in my ass. So once again, economic boogie woogie. Once again, for all you people who are like buying silver and gold, stop. Go out and get better skill sets. Because for the average person, that is the problem. You don't have an income problem. You have a skill set problem. And if I was out there in the market, I could probably get a job making $350,000 a year. If I was on, based upon my skill sets, based upon my verifiable skill sets, I've written a book. I've written several books. I have several YouTube channels. I have several online training portals. I have proof positive. And this is the thing. Years and years ago, I was just like you. I was a regular person working a job. And one of the things, the greatest things that I ever did for myself is I got myself on a massive self-education cycle. And did it pay off immediately? No. Earl Nightingale stuff, did, I was listening to Earl Nightingale stuff when I was in that boarding house. 
And the Earl Nightingale stuff really started to pay off when I started my own business. So that was like two years after I consumed the Earl Nightingale content. See, this is the thing. This is why I keep, you know, this is why when I put in the disclaimer for um, the intellectual property school, you go ahead and build a YouTube channel, you write a book, you create an online course, that ain't immediate money. I have had courses, like right now, uh, before I got sick and when I introduced home economics, I was making a lot of money from that course and because I got sick and I wasn't making YouTube videos and I started promoting it, it didn't make that much money. And honestly, I have a feeling that the intellectual property school is gonna make more money than Glennon Cameron School because I am teaching something that I currently do. Like, if it's like trucking. If I had a trucking business and I put out a trucking course, it was like he's doing, this is something I do every day. I've written books, I have YouTube channels, I have pod, and now I have podcast, I will have podcasts, and I have online courses. These are things that have made me millions of dollars, and I'm getting ready to teach you my secret sauce, my secret ways, because here's something that a lot of you don't know, because you don't do it. And I don't expect you to know this because you're not in the space. My first disruptive mail channel had like 7,000 subscribers, which is not a lot of subscribers, right? But guess how much money that channel was making? Put that in the comments. Guess how much money that YouTube channel was making with 7,000 subscribers? Just guess. Because one of the things I can teach you is how to have a small YouTube channel and let's just go ahead and talk about reality. Let's say you created a niche small YouTube channel, created authority, and about six months later, you reduced, you re release your services and products. I can tell you that with someone with a good game plan and they, they know what to do, they know how to market, they know how to advertise, they know how to sub their YouTube channel. I see stupid shit that YouTubers do every day. Well, I ain't trying to sell you nothing because they don't have the fucking confidence to sell something. And six months, you could be making two to $10,000 per month. Now, why do I say two to 10,000? Because for the average person, that is life-changing money. Two to $10,000 while you keep your job, and I'm gonna explain why you're keeping your job. Because one of the things that it takes a moment for you to acclimate to getting money. And what do I mean by that? I have done all the stupid shit with my money early because I, I did that when I had a job and a high income. I bought cars and I took trips and I did all that stupid shit and I got it out of my system. So when you get money for the first time, the first thing you want to do is go out and get all the shit that you want that you weren't able to get want, you weren't able to get because you didn't make any money, right? So there's this period where you have to grow into the money. Let me say this again. There's this period where you have to grow into the money, where you get comfortable having money in the bank. There are some people, you give them a million dollars on Monday, they will be broke by Saturday. Because they will go out and buy everything that they want. They'll get the cars. And like, I, I can tell you, uh, I had to grow into having multiple cars. Um, because one of the things is, if you have multiple cars and you don't drive them all, the battery's gonna die. So that happened with the Mercedes because I wasn't driving the Mercedes. And you know, it's like, I've been driving it lately and I, I, I kind of like it, I kind of like it. But I had to grow into having three cars. I, this is true story. When I moved into the last house, it was 5,000 square feet. I had never been in a house that big. And it, I, it took me six months to acclimate to that space. So when you start this business, you start making this money, you have to grow into it. You have to become comfortable because I'm comfortable with millions of dollars in the bank. That doesn't bother me. I have no need to, oh, I gotta go out and invest. I gotta, I gotta make sure my money's working for me. You wanna know why I don't have that? I gotta make sure my money's working for me. I've seen people, you know, when I put up receipts of what I had in the bank and it's like, that's too much money. I need my money to be working for me. Here's the thing. Unless you have millions of dollars, your money ain't gonna make that much money working for you. Let's say you had $300,000 at 7% per year. 
that's twenty thousand dollars right yeah seven like twenty one thousand dollars okay so you would need you would need a million to get 60 at 7%. Now here's something else that you, you haven't seen, like inflation has er eradicated and uh, diluted the gains of many of these people. Like let's say inflation was 10% and you had a stock portfolio that was returning uh, 10 17%. You only had a 7% gain because of inflation. So unless you like have millions and millions of dollars it's very hard for your money to outwork you. You can start a small business and within a year or two be making an additional twenty to fifty thousand dollars per year without having to consistently invest in that business. Once you get the truck, once you get the, the, the equipment that you need. Like, all right, let's talk about my YouTube business. And one of the things I always do since I am a practical person is I always have backups. Uh, I got a laptop that has four terabytes of storage. I got um, a Pro, iMac Pro with four terabytes. Of, I can edit videos on that MacBook Pro if I needed to. I got a backup camera. I always have backups. I just don't go out here and start doing stuff without a backup. When I got the uh, podcasting equipment, I got a backup Zoom recorder just in case something happens because this is my business. This is my bit. This is how I make money. So I need to have the tools and the equipment to make money because I cannot be in a situation like right now, there's something going on with Apple and it's a supply chain shortage that's kind of crazy. Um, it used to be you could get like a regular MacBook Pro from the store pretty easy. Now, they're, now if you need one, you won't be able to get that bad boy to August. So what's happening is Apple is experiencing a supply chain shortage. So instead of waiting until some shit breaks, I already have the stuff in my house. I've got the iMac Pro, I got the Apple Pro. And also, um, since I'm getting ready to write another book, um, I've also got a Windows-based computer and you know, I don't always, I, I never buy the low end. This computer cost me like 1500, has an i7 chip. And I just bought it to use naturally speaking, Dragon naturally speaking, because I needed a window based system to set that up. So, and then I, I actually in my office, I have two computers that I'm not even using. So once again, as a business person, you need to have redundancy in your systems because you, I'm never going to be in a situation where I cannot produce or make anything because my shit's broke. Never going to be in that situation. And that happened one time. I had a computer just crap out on me. The computer was like seven years old. Apple products typically last seven to eight years. And it just, one day, the screen just went blank. You know what I did? Slid over, moved to the next computer, and kept doing what I was doing. Because one of the things is you, because all of these cheap motherfuckers, like buy, you know, like the people go out and buy the Airbnbs and put all that cheap ass furniture in there. I'm like, that, that's gonna catch up with you because if I was doing Airbnb, you know one of the things I would spend a lot of money on? Mattresses. I got a mattress that came in a box. 2017 is when I bought that mattress. And that is the most comfortable mattress. Uh, the chicks I've been fucking, who's been, that's like, man, I love this mattress. It is so comfortable. I would buy that mattress and put it in my Airbnb's. I would not put some $20, $200, $300 hard ass mat. Because once again, people who are renting your Airbnb, if they have a good night's sleep on a good mattress, and I would get thousand count thread sheets, because that's what I have on my bed, it makes a difference. And I would get nice comforters. I would not just go in there and buy some bullshit and then expect to make a lot of money. But this is where the average person goes wrong because the average person operates from a deficient mindset. I don't have enough money. This is why I'm looking for all this cheap stuff. And once again, right now, uh, someone put in the comments, I predicted this, Target, all these places are having sales because they have too much inventory. So shit that you don't need, you can get super cheap. 
But the things you really need, gas, food, rent, going through the roof. And once again, my principle of income velocity, like I, like right now, I think I make, cause I don't really keep track of that. I know that's funny because I don't really keep track of my money like I used to because I'm not making as much as I used to. But I think I'm doing about 30K a month and I spend about eight to live. So even at this 10%, because you know I'm way capable of making more because I just haven't done the things I needed to do. But once again, I have an understanding because like with this business I'm in, I can make more money in six months than you can save and then invest in fucking 40 years. Let me say that again. I can make more money in six months than you can save up for investing in 40 years. You wanna know why? I ain't bragging. 2020, I made $3 million. The average portfolio size of a 60 year old is 260. There are not, cause someone put up a stat, well the number of people with seven figure portfolios, right? Was it in the millions? No, it was like 300,000, 400,000. The reality is, is not that many people with a million dollar portfolio, Dave Ramsey. There are people with it and guess what? They have high incomes. They're not making chump change. They're not driving for Uber. They're not doing DoorDash. These people have careers. Like the guy who's in college, who's gonna get out with computer science, cybersecurity, and roll into a $150,000 a year job. This is gonna be someone who can invest $30,000 a year in the stock market and become a millionaire in 20 years. $30,000 a year in 10 years is 300,000 principal. In 20 years, it's 600,000. In 30 years, it's 900,000. These are principal contributions. And if you have really good appreciation, that can turn to seven figures. Or you can do what I'm doing, create a business and be a millionaire in three to 10 years. You can drive that horse drawn buggy. Y'all man, y'all Missy, y'all Daisy. Or you can get in the fucking Ferrari and get there quicker. The choice is yours. And I think a lot of you lazy motherfuckers, I don't think anyone in the nerd tribe or the nerd game is lazy. But a lot of you lazy motherfuckers, this is why you're looking for all of this. And I, I, I see so many YouTubers do this. Passive income, it's passive income. Airbnb ain't passive income. It's income that you can get that you don't have to work that hard for, but it's not passive. The only true form of passive income is money that you get sitting on your ass doing absolutely nothing. That's passive income. Dividend stock, that's truly passive income. Uh, I've had passive income from my course sales, stuff I wasn't doing, it was just there. But true passive income is fucking hard to get. And this is why I laugh when I say all these people, it's like, well, I have a drop shipping store, a, a store that you have to hire Instagram influencers and consistently put money into and talk and do email. I'm like, how's that passive? How's that passive? But once again, the boogie woogie, the rich are going to get rich and the poor are going to get fucked. They're just going to get fucked. And I'm going to tell you why. It's about habits and behaviors. Poor people, if you like, I see this shit all the time. There are people in this building that I don't know how the fuck they got in here because I look at their furniture. It's the furniture and stuff is trash. Um, and I just see certain things. And I'm just sitting there like, that doesn't make any sense. But once again, unless we have Martians or we have some cataclysmic event, during the World War, when the United States was in World War I and II, there were motherfuckers getting rich during the state of war. When they were rationing milk, rationing food and gas, they had coupons for you to get stuff. Uh, copper, they were using copper for the war. So one of the things, like all you folks are like, man, I know you're praying for me to fall down. You're praying for me to come down to your level. Let, let me let me hip you to some. I will never ever be poor again. 
I know that since it, cause anything can happen to anybody. You know, these millionaires, they had like, number one, I am not a fucking dumbass with I would spend all of my money on some new investment. That's just fucking stupid. There's no way I would take millions of dollars and invest it in something and then go broke. The truly wealthy and the truly financially literate will never ever be poor again. You know how bad I would have to fuck up to be poor again? You know how, I mean, I would have to do some dumb shit, some dumb shit. I will never be poor again. I'll never be like you again. I know that fucks with some people's sensibilities with that, the kumbaya, we're all in it together and every, everyone can, no, no. Elon Musk will never be poor again. Bill Gates will never be poor again. Uh, Warren Buffett will never be poor. Never. There are NBA players who are not household names because they were in the NBA and they have somewhat of a fan base. These motherfuckers can make money just going and signing fucking autographs. They'll never be popo again. They won't make the kind of money they were making in the NBA, but they will make way more money than you. And see, this is one thing, the economic boogie woogie. Like one of the things is where your attention is, is where your money is. And if you make this shift that you would stop spending so much time on TikTok or YouTube or bullshit, like once again, if you just change your behavior, you could get rich and everyone's looking for millionaire game, some shit that you can do in your part time and make a lot of money where they sell that at. I know of nothing that is long term sustainable that you can do a little bit like I'll tell you a story. I know a girl who's a hoe. She's a prostitute and she was making a lot of money. She was doing between eight and twelve thousand dollars a month. Now she's 42. She can't deal with it. She can't deal with it. And because she was telling me the other day that like she's like this year, she's not work because she was wise with her money. and She put a lot of money away. She's like, I just I can't do it. And I'm like, so what are you looking for a husband? She said, funny thing you mentioned that. Yeah, I would like to be married. And I, I told her some stuff. I was like, number one, you can never tell whoever you married what you used to do. You can never ever. She's like, but I want to be honest. I was like, you be honest. You ain't getting married because all he's going to see is all them dudes fucking you over and over again. Uh, this dude who married uh, Mia Khalifa and he knew she was a porn star. And at the, like, at no point can the average man deal with a, a fact that your woman got fucked by 600 dudes. Can't deal with that shit. You're just like, mm mm. So I told her, I was like, you know, what you probably need to do is leave Atlanta and move to the Midwest and remake yourself. Get yourself a little house, get you a little job, and start meeting people, and then find your husband there. Because um, I'm telling you, if you ever told whoever you were dating that you used to be a paid hoe, he gonna put you in the box and it's gonna be real hard. Even if dude loves you, it's gonna be real hard for him to reconcile you getting all that dick. It's gonna be real hard, real, real hard. And I was like, as kinky as I am, I like, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. You know, I've dated a girl who was a escort and I, I just couldn't, you know, at some point that shit, cause, it, cause when she ain't with you, you're always think that she's fucking even when she ain't. It's like, that's what she does. And then like all these idiots who'd be marrying these porn stars. Now, if you are a porn star yourself and you marry another porn star, I actually see that working because you both out fucking other people. I see that working. But if you're a regular dude and you kiss your wife in the morning, have a fun day at work, sucking those dicks, taking it up the ass. I'll be at my boring computer job where you're getting fucked by long dick Shenango. Shango 66. He fucked that. And then at some point he's going to want to go to YouTube or 
a porn hub and look at what you're doing. He's going to see you and see th this is where it's going to. Uh, I remember I was at the sex club. And there was this couple here and his wife wanted a gangbang. And the husband was with it because, you know, they were wife swapping and stuff. And then this happened. We we're all watching this stuff and she getting fucked in this big black buck with a 12 inch dick. He starts fucking their wife. And she started making noises he ain't never heard before. And I looked at her because she was in the buck position and her toes were like spread out because he was hitting that pussy like it ain't never been hit before. And she was losing her mind. And her husband, he got mad because he can't fuck her like that. He can't fuck her like that. Because once those, those, those toes spread like, and then she was coming, I mean, Cause dude was like, bam, bam, bam. And I, I could, she, she, her eyes rolled up in the back of her head and she was like, oh, and she started making all these noises and stuff. And those toes were spread. When you fucking a chick and her toes fucking spread, you were hitting that shit just right. And I, I looked at her, I looked at the buck and I looked at the husband and the look on his face was like, what the fuck? I mean, and he was supposedly with it, right? No man wants to imagine another man giving his woman more pleasure than he can. No man, ego can't deal with it. So this is one of the reasons that I have dialed down all my kinky freaky ways because you see what happened. You see what happened when I changed my ways, you see what I got. But you know, a lot of, a lot of people don't understand. They don't understand. The economic boogie woogie.